The rest of us can turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. <clears throat> door stays shut some days and today it doesn't want to stay shut first corinthians chapter one and uh we're getting a lengthy uh text or not real lengthy but a few verses this morning is the text and hope to uh, uh preach to you this morning on something i i think it'll uh i think it'll help us i mean i hope it does i mean i pray it does uh something i uh thought of a, a couple of weeks ago and uh and i'll explain some of that as a as the Lord uh, dealt with my heart on this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then I want to preach to you on the subject, it is not about me. It is not about me. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful for what you've given to us. Thankful for a time that we can gather in your house and for a time of prayer, a time of fellowship, the singing of the great hymns. And Father, we're thankful for the messages contained within them. Lord, we ask that you now might bless the preaching time. I pray for your help this morning. I ask that you might fill me with the power of your spirit. Help me to preach those things you've laid on my heart. Father, bless in the class in the back and just help the young kids to learn more about you. I would give you all the praise for all that you will do. And we again just thank you for the time and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever I preach out of uh, the uh, book of Corinthians, uh, I always, I guess, clarify how uh, horrible of a church it was. Every now and then you'll pass and there's one not far from us. I forget what part of the world it is in. And I think the area is called, it's called the, uh, the it's called, I think the Baptist Church of Corinth or something like that. And I thought, of all the names you chose, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know that I would have chose that one. I mean, you know, even if you, you and I guess make fun of who, you know, if you're third, fourth, fifth Baptist, whatever, some big cities, they run out of numbers or whatever. I mean, because I, I guess if you can't be first, you know, you just choose the number down the road. But Corinth was one of those names that most of the time you wouldn't want to pattern your church after, at least not in the early part. Uh, they had issues. And uh, we say that kindly. I mean, they had issues. Uh, Paul came and they they had issues. He had founded this bunch. They were uh, they were you know part of his work and his mission work and uh, the folks that had left. But uh, when you go through the the book of First Corinthians and, and and fortunately I guess when you look at it on the other side you can say well they did come out of it. And matter of fact, so I guess if you named it after it as a tribute to them uh, because they weren't destroyed because of this. Uh, and so they came out the other side, but they had problems with people. They had problems with motives uh, of why they serve Christ. They had problems with doctrine, lots of problems with doctrine. Uh, matter of fact, in some ways, uh, we really appreciate the book of uh, Corinthians. It sets some things straight. Uh, we uh, pull some of our, uh, our positional passages out of there. Uh, chapter 15 on the resurrection. Uh, wonderful chapter in the word of God. Other places that define some things about church order and stuff. They had problems with that. 
church discipline. Interesting uh, uh, chapters on that and what they did uh, uh, for the saving of the church and the saving of lives uh, as far as uh, that turning people over for the destruction of the flesh. Interesting reading throughout the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is a little more, hey, you did the right thing and Paul builds them back up. And uh, we're thankful because they did. They survived all this. But as we look at them on the front side, they were a worldly church indeed. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in this uh, particular uh, passage and what we look at today, they had sort of lost their objective of their service, as Paul always does. He starts in the beginning and he gives a number of things about that, building up the Lord and telling him those things, uh, just talking sort of about uh, what God has done for us and for them. And he uh, commends them for some things. And then he sort of jumps right in there and he sort of uh, just grabs hold and uh, says some things about uh, the fact that they had sort of, again, just uh, maybe lost of what they were serving and who they were serving. And in verse 12, it says, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am Cephas, and I am of Christ. And uh, so Paul quickly, uh, he quickly put a kibosh on that in verse 13. He says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Uh, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, you know, and so he takes it. He says, hey, uh, don't don't serve under me. Don't serve uh, because I serve the Lord. And several places you'll find that Paul, uh, his humility would come out and he would again to say, I'm nothing. God, uh, sinner saved by grace. You follow me as I follow the Lord. But they had their little uh, factions within this church and they were going different ways and different routes. And Paul even said, he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize anymore. And then he named off uh, three or four folks there and some of the families there. And he says, that's all that I even baptized because they were following again. And they said that, uh, and matter of fact, you can trace some of these things uh, to their particular styles. I think there's some uh, definitions of maybe the way the uh, Apollos was and Cephas. I mean, you had people going down again, uh, uh, different paths based on what they were following. So anyway, but but again, he was bringing them back to, to center because Paul was trying to draw them back to that because again, that they might put aside those things that were sort of worldly thinking. And I think we just do that. We follow after uh, people. It's sort of natural. I think we're inclined to do that. But in these particular cases and in our service to the Lord, we have to come back to a place of seeing what is the focus, seeing what is the reality. And again, coming back to a place to finding uh, Christ at the center of that. And so uh, Paul was trying to do that. This morning, I want to give you some things uh, and we'll see within this passage of Scripture and really focusing on sort of the end of the passage that we read uh, where Paul comes down and he talks about the things of this world. He talks about the wisdom of this world and how the God doesn't always use those things that if we were a person, we might choose and say, that's what God's going to use. And, you know, a lot of people, even they take themselves and they sort of put them on a uh, particular place and said, well, God can't, uh, God can't use me for one reason or another. And they think that, and even when you read through this passage, you can sort of uh, chunk those thoughts out of the window because many times God has chosen to use things that the world might not choose to use, but he has a different plan and he has a different place. And it all does come back to uh, things that, that God would have us to do. And matter of fact, where we'll uh, sort of focus our maybe our thinking on and where even my title came from would be verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence uh, a couple of weeks ago I guess I was doing something and something came up and I think I was uh, I guess telling on myself but fretting about things that really in all honesty didn't matter and maybe not fretting but just going over those things and uh, and somewhere in line it was a uh, sort of affecting maybe what I was thinking and doing and stuff and all of a sudden, I guess I uttered to my phrase, the title I'm using this morning. I said, it's not about me. And, uh, and I just said that to myself. And, and, uh, and then over the course of time, I sort of caught on. I found myself uh, thinking that two or three other times and just came back. You know, it's not about that. And uh, I need to put those things to the side and focus on the reality of what I'm doing or what I've called to do or where I'm at, that I want to serve the Lord in that. And so Paul, I think... Uh, is directing some of the church back to that point. And I, I want to give you a couple of other things again uh, as we start the message and get into it, that he draws these people back because he wants them to see 
that everything is not necessarily about you. Now, I want to, again, preface that because there's other places in Scripture and you go, well, doesn't God care about us? And he surely does. If you flip over, I was reading that other day, uh, and I think we even uh, toyed around some of those passages last week. I mean, the very hairs of your head are numbered. God loves you uh, intimately and knows you in such a way that he uh, thinks about us and he's got a plan for us all. But in this particular thing, we're talking about our attitudes and our service to the Lord and what he would call us to do. And some of those things, when we come back and we start putting all of our, our thoughts, that's where the key is, our thoughts, our ideas, what we think we can and can't do, what maybe we should and shouldn't do. Those are the kind of things that need to be tempered through what Paul was saying here. The church in Corinth had problems with it. And we in general have problems with it. Why? Because we're human. And again, the, the verse that stands out is what we read, that again, no flesh should glory in his presence. Because, you know, there's so much that we see in the Bible, and we could go to some other places uh, where Paul wrote about, again, doing good really in the flesh, not having the Spirit involved in our life, not seeking the things of Christ and His will. Uh, we can do a number of things just of our own flesh. We learn how to do certain things, learn how to do good things sometimes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing them with the right motives, the right compassion, the right love, and centered upon Christ as he would have us to. So in reality, we want to come back to a place of seeing what the Lord would see in us, that again, he would desire that we serve not about us, but focusing. And that's where we find the first thing that I think that Paul directed these folks back to this church that was going down some paths. And this was just the beginning of his corrections. Like I said, you read through there, uh, throughout the book of Corinthians, he did a lot of correcting a lot of uh, putting them sort of in their place, sometimes very pointedly, uh, as only the Apostle Paul could do it. He didn't mince a lot of words. Uh, he came to a place and said, hey, this is wrong. Do something different. Do something else. But he brought these folks back. And the first thing that he did when they were, uh, again, going in a wayward passage and going down a way where they were a little more concerned maybe about uh, the things of of the flesh instead of the things of the Spirit and more maybe the things of self than other things, he got them focused back on Christ. And uh, first and foremost, the, the message that was important. And really, this is where we all should be. And, and having an understanding of that. And uh, of course, again, maybe not all called to ministry uh, as he dealt with here, because Paul said, for Christ sent me, he's talking about himself, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And I guess I can't read over these uh, principles, but just to tell you again that the same method that Paul said that was usable in that day is still what God chooses to use today, the preaching of the word. And it's really sad that we see, uh, and again, the sort of a side note, but again, can't cross these passages uh, without uh, commenting on that. It's a sad day that we see that a lot of churches have left that that they've left the preaching and the teaching of God's word and they, they've chosen other things and not that some of those things are necessarily wrong in, their, uh, in what they are, but they're wrong if they're put ahead and they're, they're brought in instead of that and that this is pushed out. A lot have pushed out the preaching of the word where yet that is God's vehicle that he said he has chosen because he said for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And yes, there are many who will cross the, the love of God and that they will not accept the things that were done for them on their behalf on the cross of Calvary and that they will really trample over the grace of God and over the opportunities that the Holy Spirit gives them to, to know Christ and to know Him in a free pardon of sin, to have a home in heaven. And they'll literally just continue on on their path in this world, rejecting the gospel, rejecting Christ. But again, the gospel goes to them and it's the preaching of the cross that may seem foolishness to them, but again, it's the method that God uses to save because he says unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Let us never get to a place that we tire of the, the preaching of the cross and the preaching of those things about what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It is the sum of our power. It is, again, the thing that we should make a focus and what should be in the forefront. And preaching is God's Again, chosen method for getting the gospel out. And we are to focus on those things. But to focus 
on the things of Christ. And he drew these folks back to that. First and foremost, he said, hey, he said, he said, this is what I was called to do. I was called to preach. It wasn't just about baptism. And again, we see him putting baptism in its place. That's an ordinance of the church, uh, not a mode of salvation. He says, I'm preaching the gospel that those would come to Christ. And uh, he again talks about what God would do about the wisdom of things. As a matter of fact, secondly, not only bringing them back to focus on Christ, but also that the word of God is given its proper place and that it again is given a uh, place in the forefront. You know, so often today uh, we seek something else. Matter of fact, we're in a world that that's what they want, more knowledge, more wisdom. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we haven't begun to exhaust our Bible yet. Uh, it's a living book. That's why you open it. You read the same things you may have read at some other time, and God can show you something new. He can feed you from that book. It's a living book, and I think He lives uh, in it through us and through the Holy Spirit. He shows those things to us, and He reveals things. But so many people are looking for something else, and they find that. And it seems like the devil puts those thoughts in people's mind that they want something besides the Word. They want more, and they seek the wisdom of this world, and those things combine with it. And God quickly, uh, through the Apostle Paul here in this church that was troubled, he put him down. He said that wisdom, uh, those things are, are things that are going to pass away. Uh, and that again, the wisdom of this world and those things are not what we need. And he, uh, of course, defined some of those things. He said the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. And again, God gave some of those things. He gave signs to the Jews. He did that. Jesus came doing miracles. That was done for the, the Jews. The Greeks, uh, uh, they addressed a little different way. Paul challenged them. Uh, you can see that in the book of Acts and some of the things he did with them. But again, he says, we still preach Christ crucified unto them. It may be a stumbling block to the Jews. It may be foolishness as perceived by the Greeks, but it's the message that those who come to know him, it is the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. And then he goes on to define the foolishness of, of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And so, again, when we look at those things, we need to draw back to the, to the center and make sure that our service is focused on Christ, that it comes back not of our thoughts, not of our doings, not of the things that we decide, but what He wants us to do, and that the message that we have is clear and concise and that we take the message of the gospel to all that we can and all that we give out because truly we all are uh, are called to be a, a servant and all called to be a, a representative of his and that's where a lot of people then they fall in and they say well i just can't do some things i just don't have a lot of talents and a lot of abilities and of course that's where paul addressed some of that a little bit after that god has chosen some things of the world and he's not chosen the things the world would choose but he chose the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And sometimes when we feel in our weakness, those are the things that God wants to use for his glory. So first and foremost, we come back and we focus on the things of Christ. Secondly, we find ourselves and should find ourselves following his will. You know, to follow his will, those folks uh, that he mentioned, uh, uh, and he didn't mention them by name, but he mentioned them by group. He said some of those people had come to a place of saying, hey, I'm of this guy, I'm of that guy. Uh, they weren't following the will of God there. They were seeking what they wanted. They had come to a place of just seeking a man, seeking something else, seeking again a little more maybe. You know, uh, we need to come back to a place that we want to follow the will of God. We want to make much of Jesus Christ. R.A. Torrey, the great preacher, he was the one, matter of fact, his, uh, his birthday was yesterday. I seen that on something as I was uh, looking at it. He's been passed away for a number of years. Uh, at one time pastored in uh, the Moody Church in Chicago and the Bible Institute. Some things there followed in some of the steps of D.L. Moody. Wrote much about prayer, but he said, if you make a great deal of Christ, he will make a great deal of you. If you make but little of Christ, he will make but little of you. And I thought, what a great statement that is. Oh, that we might make much of Christ in following his will. Oh, that we might put him first and foremost because that's ultimately what matters is that we serve him. And as it says that we see our calling that again, not many uh, wise men after the flesh, not many uh, mighty and many noble are called. But again, God chooses those things he desires to choose and he can use us as well. And he chooses us. But it comes back to we want to follow his will. We want to do that faithfully. 
and we want to do it in the strength that only he can give. You know, I think we, we can see a problem throughout Christianity today. And again, when you read down uh, about some of those things, as we so often, uh, I think as individuals, we struggle because we, we can do a certain number of things. We learn how to do it. We learn how to uh, serve him in a certain manner, in a certain way. But does it come down that we have uh, yielded to his strength, that we've yielded to the spirit behind it, that again, as we've seen in the text that we focus on today, that no flesh should glory in, in his presence, that we've left those things behind and we've chosen to allow Christ to work in us, to fill us, to strengthen us, to guide us. And that comes back that we have to be focused on him. We have to follow his will. And thirdly, this morning, as we uh, continue through and think on these particular things, we have to forsake our flesh. You know, probably one of the, the harder things, I think, that is a Christian that we battle with, and that's after we're saved, we've trusted in Christ, we know him as our Savior, but we battle that flesh. Paul, time and time again, speaks of that. He speaks of it in Galatians. Uh, he speaks of it in, uh, in some of the other places. You know, James, uh, the, and he was the half-brother of Christ, very pointed book, James challenges uh, the motives of people. And, and why we do those things that we do. And does it come back that we, again, that we serve out of self and we serve out of, again, our own hearts and our own ideas, maybe wondering, well, what should I uh, think of here? How shall I adjust or think this or what shall I do? Instead of saying, God, what would you have me to do? Lord, where would you have me to, to go? And, and seeking him. And it comes away with putting away our flesh that, we're not worried about the, the glory that we receive, but that only that the will of God gets accomplished and that we quit worrying about the things that this world uh, drives us to be concerned with. And I think that's what it is, is that you find that within those worldly church, that they had a lot of worldly ideas of things that were built up in them, of again, of what the world expected of them. We need to deal with those and push them away that we might come to a place that we forsake the flesh. And again, when we refer to that, we're referring to that old man, that old nature that battles within us. Paul speaks of it a number of times because once you're saved, your, your, your soul, you're saved for eternity. You've got a home in heaven. But you know, we still live in this fleshly body. That's why we can sin. Uh, that's why we're capable. Christians are capable of doing wrong, capable of sinning. Uh, we cannot feed our uh, spiritual side. And if we choose to put the word of God out of our lives and we don't pray and we don't ask for God's help, we don't seek the Holy Spirit to guide us, we don't try to find his will in the word of God, we can follow our own way. It makes us, as we find in the Bible, it makes us very carnal as Christians, very much like the church at Corinth. They're going about doing some good things maybe, but they're doing them in just the way of the world seeking the pleasures of the world, or maybe not the pleasures, but seeking the, uh, again, the admiration of the successes of the world and those things, instead of choosing what God would have us to do. And it comes down to a focus that we have to look at those things and, and sort of sit back and say, uh, it's not about me that I be lifted up, but oh, that we might come humbly like Paul and say that it's about him that Christ would be lifted up and that we forsake that flesh and we find ourselves filling ourselves with the Spirit. I know uh, the same, uh, I had mentioned R.H. Horry, D.L. Moody, uh, wrote much on that. I remember a quote I read years ago that he spoke of the church and he spoke of the things that it had. And he said, it's not that we need new things. It's not that we need uh, new hymns and new preaching and new this and that. And, uh, and again, you had to understand the context. It's not saying that necessarily just because we write new songs or we uh, write uh, new things and we have new ideas and stuff that all of that's necessarily wrong. He was just saying it's not necessarily when you look at the problems the church had. It's because, again, that they failed to do things with the Spirit of God and the power of Christ as opposed to they were just sort of seeking the pleasures or, again, the, maybe the fulfillment of this world and not necessarily the things of Christ. They had lost some focus. They had lost the following of his will, and they had lost the forsaking of the flesh. And when we lose that, again, that desire to be led by the Spirit, we find ourselves yielding to the things of the flesh. And again, Paul says, our desire should be 
that God would be lifted up, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And he says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Oh, that we might flee the earthly glory and just have that the Lord's glory might be lifted up in us as we serve him. You know, it's a, it's a different mindset in this world, but I think it's what we need. I think it's why we find a little bit of problem within Christianity today. I think it's why we find churches that are uh, without power. I think it's why we find that, again, we present uh, what seems to be the gospel message and we present those things to people and we do that, but we find that it seems like it, it's not bearing the fruit that it should. And it's right things, but many times done uh, without the power behind it, without finding those things. Uh, some of those old uh, old time folks, I know uh, between Moody and some of the others, the revivals they used to have, some of those were preceded by much prayer. They were preceded by uh, people who just called for God to move and move on their towns, move on the areas. Even those churches, some of them had, uh, I, I believe it was Moody that wanted to take one time and uh, give somebody a tour. And he said, I want to show you the furnace room. And uh, somebody said, well, why would I want to see that? But they followed the great preacher and he uh, went down, he took him down into a basement and he would uh, open the doors and they thought they were going to show him at the time, just the furnaces and the coal and the things that they used at the time. But it was men on their knees praying for the service, praying that God would empower uh, him to preach and that the message of the gospel would go out. And again, he seen that as the power behind it all. And oh, if we might grasp a little bit of those things and put some of it and realize that it's not about us and just what we can do, but it's about what God wants to do through us and with us. And the only way we do that is by focusing on Christ, following his will, forsaking the flesh, that we might be filled with the spirit of God and that it might be our desire that God uses us, that no flesh should glory in his presence that we, that if he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I think that Paul desired to have that in his life. He said, it's not about what I did. Don't follow me. Follow my Christ who saved me. You know, I think if every believer had a humble attitude as that and just said, Lord, use me as you would see fit. Help me as you would have me. Help me to serve. Help me to go. Help me to do and surrender our hearts. Oh, what a change in the Christian world we might see. Oh, what a change in churches that we might have. And again, we might be renewed with uh, true power from on high because we've seen fit to tap into what God desires to do. And he desires to do it through us. He wants to use us. Oh, may we put our uh, worldly ideas, fleshly thoughts aside, humble ourselves and seek his help that he might lead us in serving him. Again, it's not about me. It's about him. The Corinthian church, uh, they had their issues and some of their issues centered around what they thought and how they perceived themselves serving God instead of just surrendering and saying, oh Lord, it's not about me being lifted up. It's about you being lifted up. And if Jesus is lifted up as he's promised, He'll draw all men unto himself. May we seek to serve him in just that manner, lifting up the name of Christ, taking his word to the lost and dying, seeking that flesh may not have glory, but Christ has it all. Let us close today in a word of prayer and let us stand if we're able.